last but not least for my respiratory, lower respiratory, um, longer lecture. And this is my new lecture that I'm breaking up into smaller parts. And let's talk about COPD. This is another one of the big heavy hitters. Um, so um, we just talked about asthma. Um, so let's, as we're doing this, asthma and COPD are very similar, but have some distinct differences. So let's start trying to piece, uh, piece apart some of these differences. So first, um, COPD, like asthma, is chronic. But what's the difference here? Non-reversible. And so asthma, it does have the possibility of getting better. It has those episodic, um, uh, has an episodic nature where, um, you know, they could be walking around and be doing okay, not having any symptoms, and then have these like exacerbations or attacks. Now, COPD can have exacerbations. Um, but they are always kind of sick. Once, they, once they're really stuck in the COPD, it's not that they're walking around and, and things are good or getting better. Um, this is a non-reversible. It only gets worse, never better. Um, and it is based, it is an inflammatory response. So similar to asthma, it is a result of, um, uh, what do you call it? There's something that's getting in. It's usually like a chemical, like cigarette smoke, um, but it can also be from pollution. It could be from asthma. It could be from infection or uh, maybe occupational exposure to certain chemicals. Um, there also is a gene linked to it, um, but the, the lungs are getting inflamed. But the big difference here as we move on, oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, as we move on, is is that asthma was all about in the airways, in the bronchioles. And we talked about how there's that belt on the outside. And you can kind of see that here, this belt, these smooth um, smooth rings uh, around the, uh, the uh, outside of the airway start to constrict. And then there is also mucus inside. So COPD has that too. But the difference is the problem in COPD goes all the way into the air sacs. So with asthma, there's no air sac involvement. They can have air trapping and stuff like that too. Um, but there's no breakdown or problem in the alveoli where the alveoli become less elastic, stuff like that. Um, so effectively, this inflammation travels, um, you know, the, the inflammation and overreaction and asthma is mostly just in the airway or the tubes in the airway, or COPD goes all the way down to the air sacs and leads to these, this degradation or breakdown of the air sacs. Um, so um, it, it leads, because the air sacs, remember, are where gas exchange occurs or where I get oxygen in and get carbon dioxide out. So um, when it comes to the alveoli um, getting messed up, we have to think about this is going to lead to a lot, a, a lot or different problems um, because when these aren't functioning, I'm not getting gas exchange. Um, we did talk about, you know, there, there's a lot of resistance with asthma. It's hard to, to exhale, but it's a little different because with COPD, um, they start actually having CO2 retention. Um, they can't get oxygen in well, in well um, you know, in the actual alveoli. And then even worse, they cannot get that CO2 out because the alveoli are getting all broken down and degraded. So what are the hallmark symptoms? Um, so these, compared to asthma, where they have an attack, when they have an attack, it's usually a lot more sudden. Um, this is a more gradual onset of symptoms over time. So you might have a patient who comes in and says, man, you know, like I used to just get short of breath sometime with exercise, but now I'm just sitting down doing nothing and I'm starting to get short of breath. I've had this cough for a long time. So a lot of times that's one of the first symptoms they'll complain about is this chronic cough. Um, and then um, they have a lot of difficulty moving and doing activities and breathing at the same time. You may, they may also complain of, uh, you know, weight loss or have a lot of difficulty eating um, and just feel very tired and overwhelmed um, by any activity or movement. So there's a variety, uh, there's a couple different priority assessments. Um, and so um, we definitely want to listen to their lungs and we're going to notice like asthma, we're going to notice the, the wheezing. Um, and so um, especially it's going to be on expiration because uh, just like with asthma, it's hard for this patient to exhale because of that resistance or turbulence that's in the airways, preventing them from, um, you know, easily exhaling. Um, we're also going to notice they're going to maybe naturally be purslit breathing. We may notice them having a prolonged exhalation naturally. Um, something that's different, you know, um, asthma, they can trap air, but not the same way with COPD. Over time, they get what, um, what this picture is showing, which is what's known as a barrel chest. Um, so normally the space from like my shoulder and shoulder here is, is more than the space from my front and my back, um, like, you know, front to back. So like the space, um, like from the beginning of this man's chest to the back of this man's chest, it's usually not so wide. Um, but what happens when air gets trapped in that gas exchange loop? 
poop um, in the alveoli because the alveoli get all degraded and broken down is, is that the stuff starts to get trapped. So think of like a balloon that's hyperinflated. The lungs start to get hyperinflated. And so that's what we get what's called a barrel chest. It's these overinflated, hyperinflated lungs. Um, then we also might notice that they're in a position like this. This is what's called a tripod position. It's where they're like leaned forward, bent over a table, sitting really far upright. And that's in a attempt to help to ventilate better. So we've already been over a lot of this, but this is a good reminder for you um, to take a pause when you're learning about something that's different, but similar to something you've already learned and try to take a moment to think back and look and be like, how is this similar or different than something I already learned? So we talked about the onset is a little bit different. Some of the, on, the starting symptoms are a little bit different um, when it comes to asthma versus COPD. And the other big difference is the uh, difference in, in the problems in the alveoli. Um, and um, uh, long term, like someone with asthma, I'm not going around worried about their activity tolerance because it's not just activity that um, it's, it's not the activity itself that is uh, usually or always the trigger. There is exercise induced asthma. Um, but for people with COPD, they struggle with day to day life. Um, they struggle a lot with nutrition asthma. They don't usually have a nutritional issue like where like it's so bad because, again, they just have exacerbations or episodic. Um, you know, attacks and things like that, where COPD, it's like, it's always there. And they have to learn how to deal with life on a day-to-day -day basis with this chronic disease. So um, how is it, how do we know it's getting better or worse? This is going to look um, exactly like asthma in that it's getting better if their um, oxygen saturation, and their oxygen saturation does not need to be high for COPD, but we do want them to um, have an improvement if it's super low. Um, we want them to not be using their um, breathing muscles or accessory muscles so much. And more than anything, we want them to be able to tolerate activity, be able to get through the day. Um, they can progress to, ex they can have exacerbations like COPD exacerbations, it's usually why they're admitted to the hospital, um, or they can go into complete respiratory failure. Um, so with this, think worsening respiratory problems, um, like anything like with their oxygen saturation getting dangerously low, um, if their um, work of breathing accessory muscle use is getting worse, or if they're complaining of worsening shortness of breath or dyspnea. Um, diagnostic testing wise, to diagnose this, we look at, um, it, like I said, there's not as much diagnostics for this. We don't go too, too deep into diagnostics with these people, um, but we want to look at the symptoms that they're experiencing. Um, and then we can do the spirometry. So this is a, a picture of spirometry. Effectively, they close off your nose because they want to see just how you're inhaling um, in through your mouth, just they're closing the, um, the circuit so that they can get a good measure of the actual pressures and stuff for inhalation and exhalation. Um, but they're looking for airway obstruction, resistance, um, things like that. We may get a chest x-ray um, to see, um, you know, what's going on. And two things that you might notice on uh, a chest x-ray for a patient with COPD is that hyperinflation of the lungs. You're going to notice like, man, the lungs are like really huge and long and super inflated. Um, but you also might notice as a result of that, that their diaphragm is flattened. And that's because literally the lungs are hyperinflated, taking up so much space that they flatten the diaphragm. We may also get what's called a six minute walk test, which is again, with COPD, we're worried about activity tolerance. So we're seeing how they can breathe and do activities at the same time. And then we may get an ABG. And so we would be looking on this, you know, like with an asthma patient, we would want to look at the oxygenation, um, you know, may look at the pH. And again, we would expect that respiratory alkalosis with this patient, they're retaining acid, that CO2. So I'd be looking mostly at the CO2 um, for a patient with the COPD. I'm not, it's not that I'm not looking at the others. I'm going to look at their oxygenation and other things, but I really want to see how much CO2 they're retaining. Um, and then I would expect them to be in a state of respiratory acidosis because um, they are collecting acid. Um, so these mainstay treatments, you can see they're pretty much the same. And again, like, you know, for COPD, um, we may use the SAB, we'll probably use the SABA first. We might use the corticosteroid. You do not need to know which one of those two is first, but these are some of our mainstays. Um, with these, we're also going to use those inhaled anticholinergics, which I'm going to talk about um, coming up here in a minute. And we can also use the labas, um, but what's different here is this is not an allergic response. So I don't need to use those leukotriene receptor antagonists. More likely I'm gonna use what's called a PD-4 inhibitor. And you don't have to know these in depth, but just know there is a medication that can be used um, into um, uh, pretty much what it does is it decreases inflammation, which can help to uh, decrease uh, exacerbations and decrease some of the, um, it's not going to uh, cure uh, the COPD, but it can improve some of that inflammation. 
Um, airway clearance techniques are going to be super helpful for these patients. I'm going to talk about some airway clearance, some breathing stuff, but just know with COPD, um, there can be some tricky questions that ask you like, hey, how are you going to help a COPD patients with airway clearance? And airway clearance is different than um, breathing patterns, breathing techniques. So like the things I do to help with a patient's a COPD patient's breathing is different than what I do for their airway clearance. Um, I have another smaller video called respiratory priorities. So I'll talk a little bit about it, but if you find that confusing, I highly recommend watching that video that kind of breaks it down a little bit. Um, so there are some more invasive uh, procedures or surgeries that can be done. We can remove some of the diseased lung. We can insert valves to allow for better breathing. Um, these are obviously more of a last ditch effort and more for like comfort um, to try to make things a little bit better to make some room for the other um, healthy parts of the lung, um, but it doesn't actually cure or fix anything. Um, and so compared to asthma, which again, asthma is an exhalation issue. Um, COPD, they have more of a ventilation issue. They're going to need oxygen, um, but oxygen's not going to, like for asthma, we need to open the airway and give them oxygen. For COPD, um, we need them to exhale more because um, no amount of oxygen is going to fix this patient. They do have oxygenation kind of problems. Their oxygen can be low, but um, it's not that oxygen's going to come in and save the day. What really saves the day is the ability to ventilate. So going along with that, um, COPD is not an oxygen problem, it's a carbon dioxide problem. Um, with that being said, this patient's most likely going to be maintained on oxygen. They're probably even gonna go home on oxygen, um, but just know that oxygen does not fix this client. It just helps to support them in um, what they're experiencing. So the main problem is in the air sacs and in the constricted airways. And so again, it's that restrictive um, you know, belt around those airways and then that turbulence it has with the mucus. Um, we usually only keep a COPD COPD patients maintained at 88 to 92. And I've heard some people say that they were told that a COPD patient can only be maintained on two liters, no more. Um, you can maintain a patient with COPD on any levels of oxygen, even on a ventilator, on a mask and other things, but just know that's not what I'm trying for. I want the least amount of oxygen on this patient as possible. So um, with these patients, I am not trying to put a non-rebreather on them if I can help it. Just nasal cannula is usually enough. If I need more, I'll do something like that venti mask that allows me to do precise concentrations of oxygen. If they're on the ventilator, I want the least amount of oxygen needed um, in order to give the best possible outcome. Because um, again, while they might need some to sustain them in this 88 to 92, um, we don't want to give them too much. It's not going to fix them. It's counterintuitive because everything else you learn about says, oh my goodness, you have to give them more oxygen. Their oxygen's low. Um, but again, as long as they're in that 88 to 92, then I really need to look at how we're ventilating because that's going to um, help them more than anything. So there's also, like I mentioned when I was talking about asthma, there's inhaled anticholinergics. Now these are more used more often for COPD than they are for asthma. Um, but they can help a patient, um, they can help both, especially if a um, asthma patient is not responding well to the SABAs or having too many side effects with them. Um, so these all end in um, the PM, like ipretropium, um, and um, I'm probably saying that very bad, but it's best I can do. And they're short acting and long acting for these. Um, so these are going to work um, in the fact that in two different ways is that they relax the smooth muscles. So all those rings or belts around the airways that are super tight, these help to relax these, um, relax those, and they also help to dry up some secretions. Um, so, but on the flip side, as much as these can help and they can relax my airway, you know, get some rid of some of those secretions, they can dry other areas. So patients may complain of a dry mouth. So just like remember anticholinergic effects were in um, diphenhydramine and other uh, antihistamines. Um, we want to, uh, you know, um, tell them like lozenges, they can, um, you know, have, uh, you know, hard candies or chew gum if they have a dry mouth. Um, but we want to worry about other areas getting dry too. Now, generally with inhaled uh, medications, they're not as systemically absorbed, but it is possible that they could have some um, vision issues, urinary retention, constipation, that kind of stuff too. So just watching closely for those um, possible uh, side effects. All right, let's pause and do a COPD pay, uh, question. So a nurse is caring for a client with COPD. Which action by the nurse is most beneficial? And so that means that all the answers might be right, um, but which one's the best to improve their airway clearance? So remember, airway clearance. Um, uh, so I told you there's a difference between airway clearance, um, breathing patterns, techniques, and things like that. So when you think airway clearance, think I'm trying to get sputum out. Um, whereas if this said, what's the most beneficial way to improve their, um, uh, their breathing pattern, um, there'd be a different answer here. 
So airway clearance means getting sputum up. Breathing techniques or breathing pattern means getting their CO2 up. Um, so let's look at this. So we're trying to get sputum up. So it says apply oxygen to maintain SpO2 88 to 92. Now we talked about this, that like this is actually correct for COPD, but is wearing oxygen going to help me to get sputum up? This is what you need to ask yourself as you're doing this question. No, I mean, applying oxygen, it's going to help with oxygenation. So if this question said what's most beneficial to improve their oxygenation, yeah, that might be the correct answer, but this is asking about mucus. Encourage liquid throughout the day. Well, I mean, that sounds pretty good because liquid can thin secretions, which can help to get them up. So this is the answer I like the best so far, but let's keep going because it says most beneficial. Um, have the client walk in the hallway. Well, I mean, this is good for their general health. It might help with their activity tolerance. Um, and I mean, walking can help with secretions, but I know with COPD, they have super thick secretions. Um, so just getting up and walking around is not going to get them up alone. So I, I mean, I don't think that this is going to be the most beneficial, or most helpful, but I'm going to keep going. Um, teach the client purse lip breathing. So sometimes this is what happens. The students see this, they see purse lip breathing, they're like, oh, this is it, purse lip breathing, COPD. But remember, what is the question asking you? So it's asking about improving airway clearance. Um, and purse lip breathing, what that's going to help with is to get rid of CO2. Purse lip breathing does not force mucus out. It doesn't change how much mucus I have. It doesn't clear my airway. All it does is clear my CO2 or prolong the exhalation and gets more CO2 out. Um, so when this question is asking about improving airway clearance, the only thing that really gets to the bottom of the mucus directly is going to be B, which is encouraging, encouraging liquid throughout the day. It's going to thin that thick secretions because it's super thick in COPD and then help to get it out. So um, getting on to the, the other, like, again, if this was a question that was asking about positioning or breathing techniques, um, the things like if this was a breathing issue, the answer would be purse lip breathing. Um, like, because this is all the stuff that I do to get that CO2 out. So I think these are all the ways that I can get the patient ventilating better. Um, so just uh, all of the re the purpose of that question is to get you to understand the difference between airway clearance, which is like a mucus issue, um, and then breathing techniques or positioning techniques or, um, you know, ventilation techniques. Um, so, uh, you know, effectively had a bed elevated, purse lip breathing, and maybe some physical therapy, pulmonary rehab, this can get you um, get up, get moving and get that CO2 out. Whereas airway clearance, this is getting rid of sputum. So um, there's a variety. I have some videos, which I'm not going to show you, but you can definitely look up about different techniques like this. But effectively, it's different ways to get get air behind that mucus and get it out um, or agitate that excess uh, mucus to help to break it up and then get it out. Um, so there's uh, what's known as the huff cough. Um, there's CPD, uh, CPT, excuse me, um, which is chest physiotherapy or chest percussion therapy. You might see it called a few different things. Um, it clears the airway and there's what's called postural drainage. And what this is, is where effectively um, we give a patient a bronchodilator, um, then we position them based on where their mucus is. And then we agitate the mucus. And we either do that by literally like sitting there smacking on them, um, like kind of like the cupping of her hands where she's breaking it up. We can use like a, uh, we call it um, a, uh, we call it a percussion vest where it kind of shakes everything up or there's handheld percussors that we can put on the, um, the patient's chest and break things up. Um, but um, then um, then we uh, allows them to cough and get stuff up and we suction them afterward and try to get all the stuff um, up. So, so it helps to break up the extra um, uh, you know, junk that's in their airway. Um, this should always be, uh, we want to arrange this around meals because we don't want to eat this at the, we, uh, we don't want to eat this, huh? Um, we don't want to do this at the same time they're eating um, because it could lead to aspiration. Um, so we always want to do it uh, one hour before a meal or three hours after meals uh, to prevent expiration. And then this P, uh, PEP therapy is just another way to um, get things up. So I'm not going to go through all these videos, but there is the huff cough, which is where you're like, take a deep breath in and then you go, and you do it like a very forceful exhale. Um, like I said, there's manual percussion, which is where you're hitting on their back and trying to get the secretions up. Um, there's a percussion vest, which again is, um, you know, you attach to a machine and it just agitates to break up mucus. Um, there is a handheld percussion device, which is where you hold it on your chest. And when you hold it there, it helps to break up the mucus. Um, 
And then there's PEP therapy, which is a device which um, it works in order to create um, PEEP in your lungs or um, expiratory pressure and helps to uh, get some extra secretions out. And oh, not trying to watch it. All right. So, but then, like I mentioned, we also put the patients in a position that's going to allow for us to, get, depending on where their secretions are, to get those secretions up. Um, and you do not have to have these positions memorized or anything like this, but this is just to kind of get an idea that this is how we maybe position them to make sure we can maximally get those secretions up. So as the nurse, um, you know, I want to support a patient with COPD, their respiratory status. I want to keep their head of bed elevated, um, encourage fluids. Um, and we usually like extra fluids for COPD up to like three liters a day because they have such thick secretions. And this is an airway clearance. Remember, getting sputum them up issue. Um, we wanted them to get most out of their meals. I have a couple slides about nutrition I'll talk about next. And then I want to, um, uh, what do you call it? Promote them to get good, um, you know, quality of life. They, they are going to have trouble tolerating activities. So I'm going to teach them to take breaks throughout the day. I want them moving. So an answer for COPD is never stay in bed and rest all the time, but they need to, they need to move because moving is going to help with their breathing. It's going to help with their quality of life. It's going to help with their appetite. Um, but just they need to take breaks in between. So do a little bit, then take a break, do a little bit, take a break. Don't do a whole lot at once. Um, and they have, can have a lot of emotional anxiety, depression issues. So I want to help them with that. And then a lot of teaching. So um, people with COPD struggle with nutrition. A lot of it is that they're just tired. It's hard to breathe and eat at the same time, but they also have that excess sputum, which can make them nauseous, not feel good. Um, you know, they can have mental health issues from having this chronic illness. They could be mouth breathers, um, which can change um, their, uh, you know, desire and stuff to eat. Um, there could be side effects of the medications decreasing their appetite. So the best things I can tell these patients is they should rest at least 30 minutes before they eat, um, take bronchodilators um, prior to their meals to help to open things up to allow it to be easier to um, breathe and eat at the same time. They should avoid exercise for at least one hour before and one and after eating. Um, but then in between meals, let's say they eat at 8 a.m., then wait an hour, but then get up and move around a little bit because getting up and moving around and walking can stimulate their appetite and stimulate their mood, which will make them more likely to eat. And then if they need to, they can wear oxygen while they eat um, if it's prescribed um, in order to help them with their, um, uh, what do you call it, um, their nutrition. Uh, they should eat uh, high protein, moderate calorie and carbs, moderate and high or high fat. So as otherwise, most of these things are high um, that we want um, a lot of nutrients. We want really nutrient dense food. So we want them to eat their higher calorie foods first. We want them to get the most bang for their buck. Um, we want them to, lim to limit liquids at meal times because if they get full on liquids, then they're not going to have as much room for food and they need to get that highly nutritious food. Um, but also if that doesn't work um, to do that, they can have more frequent meals and snacks or try nutritional supplements to help with that. Um, we want to prevent complications for a patient with COPD by ensuring that they're administering their, their medications correctly. Um, we want to do energy conservation techniques for these patients um, that are going to help to, um, you know, like the balancing the rest and activity. We want to tell them to stop smoking because smoking um, can lead to so much worse complications. Now, sometimes people get COPD and they're just like, well, I've already got it. You know, what am I going to do? Um, but it's much better for them, even if they already have COPD, uh, they already have COPD to stop smoking because that extra inflammation is going to make things so much worse. Um, remember, this is progressive. Even if they stop smoking, it's still going to progress, but it's going to progress a lot faster if they're still smoking. Um, avoid environmental triggers or other things that might cause inflammation in their lungs. And then these people are super high risk for infections. So they need to stay immunized, um, hand hygiene, and um, avoiding sick crowds and people is going to be key for these patients. Um, so these are going to be like that high risk category that need to get all the immunizations and things like that. And then um, staying away from sick people is super key. Um, last but not least, I need to give them teaching about oxygen therapy. So these patients are commonly going to be on oxygen at home. Um, the benefits of oxygen is it improves their sleep. Their mental status can um, be better because they're getting enough oxygen to their brain and it can help with their activity tolerance or their ability to do activities. Um, some use it around the clock. Some people only use it to sleep, extra, during sleep or exercise, um, but they should always um, be following their orders or however they are directed by their physician. Um, they may need to replace their nasal cannula every two to four weeks or after they have an infection. Um, and then, of course, it is flammable. Oxygen can explode. So you need to teach them about the proper precautions to avoid this. 
So no smoking or flammable liquids around their oxygen or oxygen tank. Um, and just how to properly store it, use it, that kind of stuff to prevent problems. Um, but yes, that is COPD. I have, all I have left is environmental lung disease, which is a lot like COPD. And then I have some activities to bring it together. So um, check out the next video if that's helpful for you. See you for the next one.